be sure to follow me on Instagram. There you can hang out with me and talk to me directly. Okay, so getting into Powers of X Part 5, like we are getting to a point where the series is wrapping up. The series is coming to an end. And uh, I am very much excited about this because I'm really curious to see, not even because, I'm not really excited because it's ending. I'm excited because I wanna know where it goes next, right? I mean, I'm kind of sad it's ending to be honest, because like it's been an amazing story so far. Uh, but what this does is it initially picks up with Forge. Now, here's the thing. Here's the funny thing. I feel like only the most steadfast and staunchest of X-Men fans would know this, but Jonathan Hickman is not pulling this out of nowhere. And here's the cool thing. So initially, Charles Xavier meets with Forge to basically up upgrade Cerebro. This is one of the reasons why Hickman writing is so good is because it ties into everything, right? So if you come into this and you haven't really read the X-Men or you're not really familiar with the X-Men, the idea is, okay, cool. So some Somewhere along the lines, like Xavier asked Forge to basically upgrade Cerebro, and like, but Cerebro was originally made by Xavier, so like Hickman's changing the past. No, that's not true. Um, if you go back and you read X-Men Volume 2, issue number five, there's a point where uh where Xavier approaches Forge and basically says, You're a mutant with the ability to basically be Tony Stark, more or less, right? Like that's his power, right? His power is that he knows he can basically understand machinery and how it works and all that kind of cool stuff. That's why, like, Forge is basically the X-Men's version of Tony Stark. The difference is that Forge lost if he lost his powers, he'd be no more capable of understanding machinery than, you know, you or me, like complex machinery than like you or me, right? I mean, we can't build an Iron Man suit. Uh, but the fact remains that that during that second run of X-Men, like X-Men Volume 2, basically what ended up happening is in the aftermath of everything that had happened with the Phoenix Saga, the Dark Phoenix Sagas and all that kind of stuff, that Xavier basically approached Forge and asked him to upgrade Cerebro using Shi'ar technology. And so what this shows is basically how we got to that point, right? Like where Xavier basically walks up on, on, uh, on Forge and says, I need you to show me how it is that you, you know, like I need you to upgrade Cerebro with Shi'ar technology. And the reason why is actually a little bit different here. So beforehand, it was simply just like the system needs to be upgraded, right? Like we need to have a more, like we need to have a better reach and a stronger understanding of everything. But beforehand, it was, it was a way for Marvel to basically kind of bring the X-Men into like the modern age of storytelling, essentially, and really kind of upgrading everything across the board. The reason why it's actually happening here is because with what, what it is that Xavier wants to do, Cerebro is simply not powerful enough. But when it comes to the Shi'ar technology that's out there, it definitely is. That Xavier essentially wants to have a system of redundancy. Right, He wants to have a system to where he can copy the minds of all the mutants in existence. Now, we know that from the last House of X video, but the question was, how do we get to that point and how does it work and how can it last for the long term? And that's what Forge says. Forge is like, well, what you're asking here is not something as simple as I want to copy the minds of all beings in existence. It's a lot more nuanced than that. Like one, you need to be able to basically have an unlimited amount of storage, right? Because what you're talking about doing is backing up the minds of an individual person and then in turn having to back it up on a regular basis, right? Because what happens happens if you back up the mind of someone and then they turn evil and then they die, but you want to bring them back. If, you, if the only version that you have is the most recent one, which was their evil version, you're going to bring back the evil version of themselves. Instead, you want to go back to like back in the day. You could pick which version of themselves that you want to bring back in this new body that you would essentially be creating for them. And so if you do that, like you're going to need a vast amount of storage because you're talking about mapping and storing the human psyche, which as anybody will tell you, takes a little bit more than a thumb drive. And then from there, you're talking about having a system of redundancy, meaning that you're going to have to have multiple backups so that you, you, you don't have to worry about if if one of them goes down or gets destroyed, that you've lost all your data. So what you're talking about is an unlimited amount of information stored on an unlimited amount of storage. Like, how in the world do you expect to pull this off? Nothing on Earth exists like that. And that's when Xavier says, yes, but the Shi'ard aren't really, like they're way beyond humanity in terms of technology. Like they can store unlimited amounts of information and basically keep their technology going on forever. Hence the reason why they're a, a, an entire galactic spanning civilization that's conquered multiple civilizations and forced them all to worship them. <laughs> so it's basically like, I want five backups for this whole system. It's cool. And, and it's really interesting to see this exchange between the two because ultimately Xavier ends up asking like, you're the only real mutant on our side that I can trust with this, like, are you going to be able to make this work? Are you going to be able to pull this off? And ultimately, of course, as we know from, from X-Men history, Forge says yes. Now, here's the important thing to bear in mind. It could be that, that Xavier, I'm sorry, that uh, the Hickman comes back and changes that. That's one thing to always bear in mind when it comes to what it is that Hickman's doing. Just because things were a certain way doesn't mean they will be that way now, right? I mean, the guy's basically reworking, rebooting the X-Men for uh, for really the, the modern age. He could change anything at any point in time. So take it with a grain of salt. It's not an absolute, an absolute, you know, form 
Hickman function and structure or anything like that. Now from this point, this is this is why I love Hickman world building, right? Because imagine this, but on like a much grander scale. And that's basically how Hickman writes long form stories, right? So like three, four, five year runs on the X-Men or the Fantastic Four or the Avengers and New Avengers. That's basically how this works. And so if you recall, one of the ways in which Krakoa was able to operate as a nation as a nation state and generate income was by using the various leaves of Krakoa, the various plant life that was there to synthesize drugs that could do things like, like extend human life by five years or cure all mental, mental illnesses and different things like that. Now, something else that, that's really intriguing is the way he shines a light on Xavier here because Xavier basically travels to the Louvre alongside Magneto and usually, you know, uses his telepathic powers, forces everybody to leave and then meets with Emma Frost. And remember, this, this is kind of a cool concept because the way it seems to be going right now, Emma Frost still has dealings with the Hellfire Club, right? So she's kind of on again, off again with the X-Men. It's not where she was during like Grant Morrison's run where she's like a full on member of the X-Men. She's kind of out doing her own thing at the moment. Now, a lot of this probably comes out of X-Men versus Inhumans and the fact that what she'd done had basically been revealed, but Hickman hasn't really tied into that. So there's no reason to believe that's the absolute case. But the fact remains that what ends up happening is Xavier basically tells her like, you're aware of the fact that Krakoa is basically creating medicines out there that can essentially shut down and really ruin the entire pharmaceutical industry and the rest of the world. Like you're aware that that's what we're doing, right? Like we're basically pumping out various medicines and cures that the pharmaceutical company doesn't really seem to be interested in doing because they're putting money, they're putting profits over progression. And so because of that, like we've basically stepped in where they failed and we've essentially dominated the market now. And, and we've we've shut off pretty much every, every access point where anybody could topple us, right? Like we own the means of production. We keep the means of production secret. No one gets in or out of Krakoa unless they let them. So it's not like humanity could send in a spy. It's not like the pharmaceutical industry could send in a spy and get, a, get all this information on how to duplicate these drugs and then in turn send them out there because even then they would need Krakoa to make them. So any drug they created would be a half measure. Humanity would sniff it out fast. They would turn on it and they would go back to using the drugs that are coming out of Krakoa, the various medicines coming out of there. And so it's like we've we've essentially dominated and courted this uh, corner of this market in its entirety. What we need is the means to be able to get into countries that have a mutant population and countries that have rejected our offer. And this is what's so so really nefarious about what it is that Xavier's doing because what he basically tell her tells Emma Frost is I need you to get back into contact with Sebastian Shaw. I need you to rejoin the Hellfire Club. And it's just kind of like, wow, because it's like you will be the front face operation, right? You'll get 50%, like, I'm sorry, you'll get a 50 year contract with a more than fair share of money that's generated here. And then in turn, she'll be the public face. She'll be the marketing face, right? She'll be the one you see on TV and the commercials. And I'm in Frost. You want to live five more years? Well, then take this drug from Kakoa, you know, or, or different things like that. You know, what'll really go on is with the Black King, with, with Sebastian Shaw, because of the fact that he is by all intents and purposes a criminal, he's a bad guy, but he still has a lot of contacts and a lot of reach due to the fact that the Hellfire Club really immersed itself in what was essentially world domination, albeit behind the scenes, that what Sebastian Shaw can do is get their drugs into uh, into these countries that have rejected the offers of Krakoa by using like Black Book operations, and then in turn, get mutants out and get the drugs in. It's a pretty nefarious plan because what it basically means is flooding countries with the Krakoan drugs. And, and, and it's, it's pretty sinister, like it's pretty dark. Xavier's becoming like a drug kingpin now is essentially what it is. <laughs> now it's, it's interesting because Xavier masks it behind the perception of, well, it's, it's all in the effort of getting mutants out and basically getting them back home to Krakoa. But it, but it seems it, even then it's pretty dark. And this is, this is actually really cool. I dig this because what it shows is that Xavier is willing to do whatever needs to be done in order to get his mutants back home, right? I mean, that's one of the things we've talked about recently. The people who win the wars are the ones that do what needs to be done to win the war. Not the guy trying to change the hearts and minds. That doesn't work, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's cool. It works really effectively because at the end of the day, Emma Frost basically says, yes, I'll side with you on this. I'll help you make this happen. We will find a way to pull this off. And that's why it's so awesome here. That's why you see this, this really cool concept, because what they also do is they say, we want to bring you on, we want to give you two seats on the Quiet Council of Krakoa, basically a council of 12 that's leading the Krakoan uh, mutant population, basically the entirety of the mutant population, all going to be led by, by a council of the 12. Magneto and Professor X, of course, with it being named after the after the seasons, Magneto and Professor X are going to be, you know, two of the three. We don't know the other ones, and then we know that Sebastian Shaw and Emma Frost are going to take two spots, and then Emma Frost is asking for a third. We have no idea who that one's going to go to. It'd be awesome if it went to Hellion, if they brought him back, but nonetheless, at this point, it basically is it's kind of like this telepathic message 
sent out to Xavier, which gives us the reason why all these mutants appeared on Krakoa in the last issue. It's basically saying like, we are working on a thing, like Krakoa will become your home if you choose to accept it. If you want to be here, you'll be safe from all prying eyes, you'll be safe from, from all forms of humanity's oppression, this will be a safe space for you. Notice here that what, what Xavier's basically doing here is Avalon, right? Avalon, Providence, whatever you want to call it, you know, from Magneto's history when he created like Asteroid M and basically brought all the mutants or as many mutants as would leave Earth. Xavier opposed him at that point in time. It was like, that's a terrible idea. We have to have the peaceful coexistence between, between humans and mutants. What Xavier seems to have recently done and or done in recent years is understand that like sometimes you can't change the hearts and minds of people and you never should have tried in the first place. That what you should have done was just said, hey, look, if that's how you want it to be, that's fine. Then we'll all just go over here. But understand, like, let me make this clear in no uncertain terms. You stay away, we stay away. If you come over to where we're at, then we're going to we're, we're gonna bring everything you know and love to ruin, right? While, while everything that you know and love burns down around you in ash, you're going to have to look and accept the fact you did this to yourself. At the end of the day, it's basically keeping all the mutant population safeguarded by whatever means necessary. Now, a funny thing that kind of goes on here, and this is why I love the way that Jonathan Hickman writes Namor the Submariner. Namor the Submariner gets a message, of course, from, from Xavier because Namor's a mutant. And so as a result of that, Namor, of course, being a proud king, you know, the, the king of Atlantis, is told by Xavier, why in the world would I accept your offer? You want to play king, and that's cute, and that's fine, but boy, I've been a king for eons. Like, I've been a king for a long time. So while it's nice that you want to do this, you hardly know what it means. So you don't really understand what you're asking. You don't know what you're creating. You're just doing a thing, whereas I understand what it really means to be a king. So if you want to give me your offer, that's fine, but come back when you're serious. Come back when you actually mean it, and you actually know what you're talking about. Dude, I love Namor. I love the way that Hickman writes Namor because he's so arrogant and so haughty. It's so awesome just to see Namor written in such a, a, such a really cool way. But again, jumping 1,000 years in the future, in the last few issues or so, we had basically talked about how this new elevated form of what was, uh, I should say, kind of a combination of humanity and machinery had basically moved in the direction of wanting to be absorbed by the phalanx, right? To kind of becoming part of this universal consciousness. So basically going out and becoming something greater, you know, a higher state of enlightenment or entropy or, or whatever it is you want to call it. It was a cool thing because with them reaching this point and the phalanx arriving, the question was, if we essentially put our consciousness into a pure machine shell, as opposed to, you know, part human and part machine, are you guys going to accept that? And the response of the of the, the, the phalanx is now given when they say, yes, we find this acceptable. We find it acceptable that, that because you were bred is a combination between whatever your biological race was, which was human, and machinery being merged together as a cyborg reaching its current form of enlightenment, you're not truly a machine. And we as the phalanx only absorb like machine-based entities. So put your consciousness in a machine and you can come hang out. Like it's basically what it comes down to. And it works because as soon as that happens, the elders basically eradicated by the, by the entirety or at least by this particular phalanx force. And when the question is asked by the librarian, when it's talking to this future version of Nimrod, why is it the Elder was destroyed? Nimrod basically responds by saying, when it comes to the phalanx, there's simply just but one phase out there. And this is Hickman doing a huge amount of world building. Because what Hickman basically says is that throughout the entirety of the universe, you have black holes. And where conventional wisdom would tell us that black holes are just giant gravity wells, right? Collapsed dead stars that suck in everything around it, including light, and nothing gets in. And it just gets broken down on the atomic level. And then who in the hell knows what happens at the center of it? Because it's all theoretical, because nobody's ever been there before. What he actually says here is that these black holes are essentially collapsed dead civilizations, right? Like entire intellectual civilizations whose entire overall knowledge and, and experience and everything just collapsed in on itself. Basically, it got so smart, it collapsed in on itself. And when that happened, it basically created a kind of fissure in space time. But each one is not really alone. Instead, it's part of a greater whole. And this greater whole is this giant series of networks. And so essentially, every single black hole in the universe is one part of this giant collective consciousness. And so because of that, like it's all networked and the 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 phalanx in turn come under that you know and, it, and it's a cool concept because what it basically means is that it's it's literally the universe's own intelligence more or less it's a cool thing because what this means is that this kind of higher level thinking that it starts out that if you really kind of piece these things together and this is why jonathan hickman is such an amazing writer if you piece these things together what you have are baseline sentinels from baseline sentinels you go to mother or you go to master molds from master molds you go to mother molds from mother molds you go to like actual like omega sentinels right? So basically a blending between human and machine. From there, you go on to a higher level, which is the Nimrod. And then from the Nimrod, you go on to yet even higher levels. If they get high enough, they achieve like, I'm sorry, if they achieve a late uh, state of enlightenment, they end up getting to their current form. And then, then from there, they merge with the phalanx. And then merging with the phalanx goes on to become even an even bigger part of, a, of an empire, which the phalanx themselves serve this absolute intelligence across the universe. It's an awesome sort of introduction, right? Because, you know, Hickman really breaks this down. You've got the Technarch, you've got the Worldmind, you've got the phalanx, you've got Titans, you've got, uh, you've got the, the stronghold, and then you've got a dominion, 
right? So kind of going from like the baseline and then building it all the way back up here, there are multiple threats, right? There are multiple concepts that really all kind of seem to lead to this final level of super intelligence. It's a cool concept. I'm digging it. Like I'm really loving what it is that Hickman's doing. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Four. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.